Hi everybody, this is a little bit of a special video. Uh, one of the things I like to do on this channel and just in life in general occasionally is to talk about movies. And I love to talk about movies with really smart people. So it's so nice to have joining me for this video, my pal, my fellow YouTuber and actual smart person, Christy Winters. Hi Christy, how's it going? Hello, hi Steve. I'm really excited that we're doing this again. Um, <laughs> But yes, this is going to be a fantastic conversation. I know. Yes, we, we both know it's going to be because we've had it before. Um, <laughs> the conversation is going to be about one of our favorite movies, uh, a movie that I've loved for really most of my life now. It's hard to think that I've been alive that long, but uh, it's the movie 12 Angry Men. And we're going to be talking about the most famous version of this story. The 12 Angry Men has been filmed several times. And of course, now it's also been done on the stage countless times. Uh, but we're going to be talking about the 1957 film version of 12 Angry Men, which was directed by Sidney Lumet. It was actually Sidney Lumet's first feature film uh, after a long career in television. And of course, he also went on to direct other great films like Serpico and Dog Day Afternoon. Uh, it's written by Reginald Rose, who again is a legendary writer from the golden age of television, wrote for Studio One, uh, wrote many classic episodes of that great anthology series. Uh, and it's produced by and starring Henry Fonda. And this is the most famous version of the story. It was originally produced on Studio One in 1954. It was remade in 1997 for Showtime with a, a similarly all-star cast. But we're going to talk about the 1957 version of 12 Angry Men. And we're going to be talking about it specifically from sort of a, a sociological perspective, a sociopolitical perspective, not just whether it works or not as a movie, but the sort of lessons we can take from it, the sort of messages we can find in it about how we relate to one another, about society, about politics, about uh, the human condition, you know? Um, so let's get started because, uh, Christy, you were kind enough to write some really awesome detailed notes about this movie from the, the social science sort of perspective, which is your forte. Um, and one of the first things you mentioned in your in your notes, and when we've talked about this before, is one of the major criticisms of this version of the movie today is that it has like an all an all white or mostly white uh, and all male cast, and pe people sort of criticize this version of the film today for being a little anachronistic because of its lack of diversity. But according to you, your reading of the film it actually works because of that lack of diversity, right? Yeah, um, so I love this film. I don't know when I saw it, but um, I too, like you, it's become one of my favorite films. And when I started to think about, uh, I watched it a couple of times and I introduced my friends to it. So I had to, an opportunity to see it sort of a lot of times in a row. And when you do that, you start picking up on sort of, you see it from the writer's perspective of how do you create the characters and how do you foreshadow things. And in terms of the dynamics of race, you couldn't make this movie today because you couldn't have a jury made up of all white men like this. But within this very uh, sort of microcosm, it looks like all of these people should have the same sort of white male privilege if you just look at it as the film starts. But what the film then explores are the sort of rankings and the tensions even within the most privileged group. And you see basically the same kinds of power dynamics and marginalization that men who enjoy white male privilege are accused of, you know, sort of, well, not, no, not of having, but a system that enables you to keep people down um, and benefits other groups. It actually is in play in this group as well. And so you're able to see them as equals because they're all sort of in the same group, but there's also the power dynamics that are happening, that happen with other groups as well. So I think by limiting it to a narrower group, you take out issues like racism and sexism, and you focus really on the power dynamics and what was respect is and who is giving respect and why are they giving respect, um, and how far do you extend empathy? And then that asks the question about, can you extend it beyond the group? So yeah, I think, um, it, it, I'm glad the movie was made when it was, because I think the biggest problem with the Showtime version is that it loses that edge because so many other political, socio-political dynamics are brought into it, economics, you know, as well. So, yeah, that was my reading of it, why I thought it worked. Yeah, um, and, you know, it, when you look at it that way, it actually becomes a really interesting uh, conversation starter for what I think is a, a subject that we should probably, if not talk about more, at least be aware about 
more aware of in uh, the 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 activist social justice community, which is uh, how intersectional all of these different forms of privilege and underprivilege are. Uh, a lot of times when you when you criticize something from let's say a feminist perspective and you say well you know you make a, a generalized statement like men are privileged and women are underprivileged someone will come back at you and say well not all men are privileged what about poor men what about you know men who are members of minority classes what about and all these other things and you realize that you have to that you have to sort of stick to the subject that you're talking about but you also have to recognize that privilege is a very complicated thing. And, and we all identify with all these different groups simultaneously. And we might identify with some groups that are generally tending to be privileged and some groups that are underprivileged. Uh, and it, it, and it, the privilege or underprivileged status comes into play depending on what situation we're in at any given time. So this movie is actually a really good way of starting to talk about that because as you say, you can see that they're all part of one kind of privileged group, but then all of their differences start to come up uh, as the film goes on. You see how different they are even within their own privileged group. Yeah, exactly. Um, well, you talked about empathy. You mentioned empathy, and that was one of the things that uh, I wanted to talk about because empathy to me, and for those of you who have never seen the movie, first of all, I don't know how you've gotten this far into this video. If you haven't watched 12 Angry Men, you should you should probably go yeah, watch it. Spoiler alert. If you haven't watched it. <laughs> well, yeah, spoiler alert, because we're going to be talking about the plot of the movie, but we're also going to be talking about things that sort of drive the characters and drive the movie along. And, and one of the most effective tools in the movie that the characters use to persuade each other is appealing to empathy. Um, I, I thought it was very interesting, because and, and just to very briefly summarize the, the bare bones story of the film. These are 12 men who are in uh, a jury room. They're deliberating over a murder case. And if they, if they bring back a guilty verdict, the defendant uh, will face execution. And the defendant is a young person of sort of indeterminate race, uh, maybe a white person, maybe not a white person. They, there are white people in the room that certainly don't treat him as one of them. They treat him as a minority. Uh, but the, the first vote comes back and it's 11 votes for guilty and one vote for not guilty. And the one vote for not guilty is who turns out to be sort of the film's hero, Henry Fonda's character, juror number eight. And one of the first things he says to justify why he is the one not guilty vote in a room full of guilty votes is that he thinks about what kind of a life the defendant must have had. He puts himself in the defendant's shoes and he seems at first to be the only person who's willing to do that. And it's really his, his, not only his ability to empathize with another person who comes from a different background, but his, his willingness to do it. He, he puts himself there. He tries to project himself into that boy's life. And he says, you know, think about the life that this kid has had. He's been hit on the head once a day, every day. I mean, he's been, he's lived uh, such a terrible life. He's faced so much abuse. I think he deserves to have a little bit of consideration from us. You know, his empathy is what pushes him to stand up. And I would expand on that by also applying his empathy to the judicial process. And you were talking about that. I was thinking of his line where he said, you know, I sat in the jury box for six days and I don't think the kid's lawyer did a very good job. If I, you know, I would have fired, fired him and hired a different lawyer, I would want my lawyer to do this. So rather than just passively, you know, getting the information from the trial, he was actually thinking about it from the perspective of the prosecutor and the defendant. And that again requires that kind of empathy. So what would I want in terms of reasonable doubt if I were the one on trial? Um, and this I think ties into the emotional empathy. I mean, the Fonda character is the one who refers to him as the kid. And he's 18 years old, either when he committed the crime or at the time of the trial. But he consistently talks about him being a kid, whereas the other jurors who are voting guilty talk about him being the guy. Um, and so again, this is an attempt to open them up a little bit more to see him as more of the child that he's so recently been and also appealing, I think, to their sense of reasonable doubt and that necessity and that we should be considering this from his perspective as well, not just the prosecutions. And really one of the, one of the central conflicts of the movie uh, maybe the central conflict, depending on how you read the movie, but one of certainly one of the central conflicts of the movie is 
this conflict of empathy versus apathy because nice the apathy, segue. thank you thank Very you nice segue i do this you know i do this <laughs> um <laughs> and uh because the the other 11 jurors begin not all of them are are hard pressed you know against the defendant some of them just seem not to care and they have voted guilty because they've sort of read the room and perceived that guilty is the overwhelming sentiment. So they vote guilty because they just want to get out of there. I mean, several of them, we, we notice actually a lot of them when they first sort of come into the jury room at the beginning of the film, they're talking about anything but the case. They're sort of milling around, making chit chat. Uh, and one of them is talking about the Jack Warden character, uh, juror number seven, who sits at the end of the table right next to Henry Fonda's character. He's talking about uh, how he has tickets to a ball game. He wants to go see a, a, a Yankees game. And he wants to, let's try to get this over with by seven, you know, because I got to go to the ball game. And that seems to be what he cares about far more than the result of this trial. And there are others, you know, the, the broker is like reading the newspaper, wants to see how the market closed. Uh, they're, they're completely, not maybe not completely indifferent, but largely indifferent to the fate of uh, the defendant. And so it's, it's Henry Fonda's character not only applying his empathy to the defendant, but also using it to sort of try to push back against the apathy of, of these 11 other guys who, you know, I think that one of the most interesting things about the movie is that they weren't dead set against the kid they just had their own things to worry about and it was not just their you know their their conclusion that that the defendant was guilty that henry fonda was pushing against it was their own sense of that this wasn't even that important to them yes and i think one of the reasons the film work is because it works is because so many of the characters have such vibrant internal stories that inform how they're perceiving the situation. And so I think it, it's a great opportunity for the writer to, we talked in our, our the conversation that didn't record properly about um, the levels of skepticism. So the, the broker being the person who has a more, more extreme sort of, you have to disprove every piece of evidence before I'm going to change my mind to the old man who is willing to just keep talking um, and helps out um, Henry Fondra in his play to keep the, the jury um, considering whether or not he's guilty. And so yeah, I think that um, all of these things make it uh, a very fascinating examination of how people come to their conclusions. Um, you know, the things that influence them, whether it's disconnection because you don't care about the person, or you have an emotional stake in the outcome because of your own personal life, which is obviously one of the things that really drives the story. Yeah, and and uh, starting with Henry Fonda as the first guy to vote not guilty, and then as more people sort of join his side uh it's interesting to talk about it in those terms because later in the movie at, at one point someone is is sort of chided for talking about it in terms of one side versus another uh but th the more people join henry fonda's side and the more people who are arguing for a not guilty vote you see the different techniques you know that they are using to appeal to the the people left on the guilty side. It's it, it, one of the in, things that has always interested me about the movie is to see those character dynamics and to see how what would persuade one juror doesn't really seem to matter to the others. And you know the 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 old man, juror number nine, the first person to sort of join Henry Fonda in voting not guilty, he at first doesn't even express any real conviction that the kid is not guilty. He just says, "I would like to hear more." So for him, it wasn't about any particular piece of evidence, at least not at first. He talks about evidence later in the movie, but at first he's just like, you know what? I agree with this guy. I just think we're not sure yet, and, we want, and I want to talk more about it. For other people, it's more hard evidence. It's, it's you know, uh, learning that maybe it's not so plausible that a key witness made it to his front door in, in, in the time that he said he did. You know, uh, so the the different methods of argumentation and it's really not just a good movie to watch to talk about sociological stuff. But if you want to talk about, as you said, the different levels of skepticism that the characters have and the different types of arguments you could make to try to convince someone of something, because it's we have we see different types, not just different levels, but different types of skepticism. Some people are responsive to emotional appeals. Some people are care about nothing but the empirical evidence. Some people just want to 
be open-minded and just hear what other people have to say or sort of leave the conclusion open until they're sure one way or the other. I think that's a really fascinating part of the way these guys interact. Yeah, and the importance of skepticism, especially in a jury situation, witnesses together, um, you know, looking at facts in tandem and being, and importantly, being open to changing your mind. Uh, and that's yeah. something, well, obviously, that's a key point in the film. And so I think thematically, the importance of skepticism is an underlying sort of thing that it's promoting as, as important and actually vital for us to have a real justice system. Yeah, I'm glad you brought up the importance of changing your mind because that I know that's something that we talked about when we talked about this before, and it's it's something that really really struck me uh, when I watched the film just recently. And it's it's one of those it's one of those movies that you sort of notice different things about it every time you watch it. And and this most recent time that I watched it, the thing that really struck me was that it treats changing your mind as as a noble thing. You know, changing your mind is often when when we think about, you know, so-and-so changed his mind, we sometimes characterize that as being weak, as though he, you know, he he let go of his convictions. He changed his mind, you know. But in 12 Angry Men, changing your mind is something that happens when you become convinced that you were wrong and you change your mind so that you accept what you now think to be right. It's a sign of strength. It's a good thing. And I think that's a message uh, that we don't get very often. Even and this is again, this is this movie was made in 1957. The story was written in 1954. So this is uh, a mid 20th century piece, and yet here we are in the early 21st century, and we're still struggling with this concept of you know, changing your mind is not a bad thing if you have a good reason to change your mind. Yeah, you know? and maybe also building on that, if I might, is you know they're changing their mind in light of the weight of the death of a man. You know, like my decision here is going to have real life consequences and having the ability to recognize that and see that, yeah, you know what, my opinion isn't as important as this person's life. So it's more important that I get this right. It's good practice, you know, intellectually for when you have to do it in real life, because usually there isn't that much at stake at changing in changing your mind when you're presented with counter evidence other than your wounded ego. And sometimes it's better to just recognize that you're resisting something because you don't like it and go, you know what, I need to change my mind on this. Um, and so I think that pointing that out maybe is um, you know, the difference between doing it in everyday life in a jury situation. Obviously, the jury situation is more important, but the lesson is still there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And um, I wanted to talk a little bit about... Uh, Speaking of how of the different reasons that they change their mind, uh, one of the things we talked about last time as well, and one of the things you mentioned in in your really excellent notes, which by the way only I get to see, everybody watching, this. <laughs> just for me, just for me and Christy, you don't get to maybe, see. Maybe maybe I'll get him to put them um, in, in, a, in a comment box or something. Yeah, yeah. yeah. If, 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 if enough really people ask, see. if enough people ask. Yeah, if you really <laughs> want to see the notes, um, but uh, of course, one of the the themes one of the more overt themes in the movie is uh, we, we were talking earlier about the sort of intergroup dynamics. And of course, one of the most overt uh, explorations of that is the, the issue of racism. Uh, racism becomes a, a very explicit part of, of the character of, of one of these jurors. One of the jurors, the, the, the character played by Ed Begley, uh, turns out to be just a flat out racist. And he, he becomes so racist, in fact, that it triggers one of the most powerful images in the movie, which is when he goes off on this racist tirade about, you know, the kid is one of them and, you know, they're, they're born liars. And, you know, he just goes on in this really ugly racist rant, um, proving, by the way, that you can say really horribly racist things without using a single racial epithet because he never drops a single racial epithet in this rant of his, but what he says is absolutely repugnant. Uh, and it's so ugly that the other jurors actually turn their backs on him. And it's a really powerful moment to see everybody else finally sort of having enough and standing up and walking away from the table. And after that is done, that juror, the Ed Begley character, is sort of kicked out of the group. Uh, they sort of toss him out and, and close ranks without him. And he never, he, he goes, he even goes and sits on an, at another table. He sits at a little desk in the corner of the room and never returns to the central jury table with the rest of them. And that's a really powerful moment, but you also have to 
keep in mind that this was not the first time he had said racist things. He had been saying subtly racist things for the whole movie. And it feels like, yes, it's a nice moment when everybody else finally sort of stands up and says enough. But think of all of the things that they were willing to tolerate from him until he got to that point where it was just undeniable. Yeah, I think when the movie starts, he starts making comments almost from the start. And then as time goes on, because this happens closer to the end, but people, uh, so the Jack Cookman's character who grew up in a slum starts to articulate his background. Um, there's some comments made to you know, the immigrant and he pushes back a little bit and gives a be beautiful speech on the importance of justice. And so their own racism is kind of being exposed within the ranks. And I think you're starting to extend um, more sympathy to people in the room. And then when the guy goes off, it really just puts the casual comments into their very ugly faced context where this is really coming from. And yeah, the, the importance of that scene is that one of the other themes that I talk about in my notes is the talking and listening. And you'll hear people talk about talking and listening throughout the film. And the way that they shut him down within this sort of you know, similar group dynamic is everyone turns their back on him. They stop giving him, he, they no longer recognize him really as a member of the group. And that's the most powerful thing that you can do, you know, aside from, you know, if you're going to work within a system of democracy with equal rights, um, shutting those people out and not recognizing them, not listening to them is putting them on the naughty step basically, and saying, you're, you're not going to be coming back into the group until you behave. You can't behave like this. And that, I think, is why the having an all-white male cast is necessary, because it shows most, you know, clearly, it could have had been all, you know, a different group of women or whatever else, but in this case, it was white men, so it is. Um, but that is how you deal with undesirable views. The best thing to do is to not recognize them, not listen to them until they understand why they're being excluded and start to reform their ways. And so I think, yeah, the, the, the whole thing of it just really works, the emotions, the building of it, um, and the power dynamics and the theme of talking and listening that has already been set up really brings it all together beautifully. Yeah, uh, they, they basically block him. <laughs> yeah, if, yeah. if the jury deliberations had been taking place on Twitter, they would have just blocked him. <laughs> yeah. um, and I, I love that the, 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 the final person to sort of turn away from him, the last person remaining at the table listening to his rant, the person that he turns to when he's realized that everybody else is sort of bailing on him, is the broker, the, the, uh, the E.G. Marshall character, who is the most calm and coldly rational character in the room. He's not given to emotion. He doesn't seem vulnerable to sort of emotional appeals. And yet, not only is he the one who finally says to the racist, basically, shut up. Uh, he actually, actually, he says, I, I, I hear you. He makes sure to say, you know, he's the, the, the racist says, aren't you, know, aren't you, aren't you listening? And the E.G. Marshall character says, I have been listening. Now shut up and don't open your mouth again. And it's, it's, I think it's important that it's, it's the most coldly rational, least emotional person in the room. Uh, who says that to him, and he says it in such a, a calm but yet forceful way. It's not just that what he's saying is upsetting to people. It's not just that what he's saying hurts people's feelings. It's that even even the guy who doesn't even seem to have feelings for most of the of, of the of the movie is saying, no, what you're saying is is not okay. You know, it's it's not an emotional thing. What you're saying is not okay. Now you have to get out. Yeah, you could I mean Fonda delivering that line wouldn't have been the same. And it yeah. just shows how great the writing is that he knew those characters and he knew how to use the characters to make, you know, really intense situations. So, yeah, it's a, another reason to watch this movie. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you would expect yeah, you would expect Fonda's character to say something like that. You know, because yeah. he's he's clearly a very he's a very a, clearly a very humane character. Uh, but to have the the cold, rational, skeptical guy say, "Hey, you know, enough, shut up." is is really powerful um you mentioned that some of the other characters sort of butt heads on on racial uh or et, or eth ethnic uh disagreements and uh one of the the other powerful moments in in this sort of conflict other than that big moment that we just talked about is there's a, a smaller moment between one of the characters who is an immigrant and the aforementioned uh baseball fan and it's 
a really it, it leads to this really wonderful speech that you mentioned from the the immigrant um the george Voskovec character where uh there's a there's a point about midway through the film where the the jack warden character who has been voting guilty the whole time just sort of throws up his hands and says okay we're stuck so i'm gonna get things moving i'm gonna vote not guilty and the immigrant really gets in his face about it and says you know if you think he's guilty vote because you then vote guilty if you think he's not guilty then vote that way but don't just change your vote because you just want to get out of here because you have some baseball tickets burning a hole in your pocket and he really kind of gives him a lesson on what the jury is even supposed to do and what their job is and, and the gravity of what they're doing here which is something that a lot of them are still sort of not quite grasping uh, and then we see the Jack Warden character kind of pushing back against him, uh, telling him, you know, uh, I think at an earlier point in the film, he said to him something like, you know, oh, these immigrants, they come over here running for their lives. And then before their feet are dry, they're telling us how to run the show. You know, yeah, it was on the question of reasonable doubt. Yeah. Yeah. He this immigrant was saying, oh, I have reasonable doubt. And the guy's like, blah, blah, blah. And the immigrant said, oh, maybe you don't know what reasonable doubt is. Yeah. He got really offended. I mean, he clearly doesn't understand what reasonable <laughs> doubt is. So, but um. yeah, that guy, the, the baseball fan is a really interesting character because, and that's another character that you mentioned earlier, the, uh, how the, the 1997 version doesn't really hold up compared to this version. And there are, I think there are a lot of reasons for that. Part of it, I think is that it loses the, the, the focus of the, the dynamics between the cast, but also, you know, I think the writing, a lot of the writing is just a little soggier. Uh, when when the the immigrant confronts the baseball fan and says, you know, you know, guilty or not guilty, and Jack Warden says not guilty, and he says why, and Jack Warden says uh, I don't think he's guilty, and he he doesn't sound very sincere, and the immigrant just kind of walks away from that, feeling looking like he's very dissatisfied with it, like he's just sort of gone out oh, whatever and walked away, whereas. In the 1997 version, that's played as a much more important moment. The 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 newer version of the baseball fan, and that version played by Tony Danza, he says that line. Yeah, <laughs> he says that line uh, with a lot more sincerity. You know, with a lot more gravitas. He says, "Because I don't think he's guilty." You know, like he's really been convinced, and it just doesn't work as well. The moment works in the original movie because it really seems like the guy still doesn't quite get it. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. And he's um, just saying it to get this guy off his back. <laughs> yes. And then I guess we should, if we're going to talk about, you know, re changing, are we? I guess we should talk about maybe uh, the the in when you're evaluating and your skepticism, identifying the difference between your emotional sides and the facts, um, and how those lead together, and uh, the Shaolin man character. Yes. And his transition over the course of the film, uh, which yes. is. Probably the biggest emotional arc, you know, kind of ends it. So, um, yeah, he definitely has the biggest arc, and he's my favorite character. <laughs> well, you don't want to leave this one out. No, uh, well, did you did you want to go? Did you want to talk about him a little bit about how well, he sort of he because he he does he is one of those guys that talks about facts quite a bit. Yeah. So another, you know, again, the beauty of the film is the way that it really sets things up in the start so they blossom later on. And a lot of people are hoisted on petards. So if you haven't seen it or if you're going to watch it again, look for people's early dialogue to kind of be called back and in the made uh, look a bit of a fool for it. But uh, I call him Shouty Man. I can't remember what jury number he is. But um, he is three. almost a, three. Yes. When they start deliberating, almost his opening line in that turn of, you know, why you think. The, why you voted guilty was okay. I've got no investment here. I'm just interested in the facts. And throughout the film, he keeps claiming to be led by the facts, but as the facts fall away, he doesn't actually change his mind. He just reinvents the story or denies that all of these bits of this, the prosecution's case have slipped away and are actually now pointing in the other direction. Um, and they also set up his relationship with his son, which is very sort of talk about toxic mass toxic masculinity yeah. in terms of um, you know wanting to make his boy into a man and now their dysfunctional relationship and at the climactic moment um, 
when he's did, he's the last one standing. Um, we've had basically the yeah the, the votes have shifted. There's been this sort of storm, and when it was deadline six, they're tied six six, and now we're to the end where the shouty man is eleven to one against everybody else in the room, putting him in the reverse situation that James uh, Henry Fonda was in when we started the the voting. Again, the symmetry in this movie is beautiful, yeah. but um, he's spouting all of this nonsense about basically going through all the stuff that's been refuted as if that's the case and he throws his notes down he throws down a picture of his son and he just starts to talk again about kids and how they they rip you you work your heart out because of his agony over his relationship with his son and in his anger he just rips the picture of him and his son together up and then realizes what he's done and the enormity of the pain and what he was doing and how he's twisted it and how much he misses his son it all just comes out in that moment and he just sobs not guilty not guilty and it's just gives me chills you know it's such a great performance yeah it really is amazing and it's it's the best of all of there are several big moments in the movie where people change their minds but of course this is the biggest one and again it's not it, it's not a sense that he is weak for doing that it's not like oh henry fonda won you know he got the last one it's it's almost as if juror number three is is at least for a moment uh, unburdening himself of all of this baggage that he's carried around about him and his son and his his regret and his guilt for having pushed his son away and uh, sort of been he he clearly has. He, he seems to know that he is responsible for his estrangement from his son, but yet, you know, he's, he's the guy who sort of digs in his heels and says, you know, ah, kids, you know. Uh, and when he finally has that moment of clarity, that, that epiphany, and he does, and, he, and he's sobbing when he says not guilty, uh, at least for that moment, it feels like he's had a breakthrough. It's not a moment of weakness at all. It's, 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 a, it's a glorious moment. You know, it's, it's all good for him. You know? Yes, and the direction here is so important because it doesn't move fast after that. I think then the music comes up, right, mm -hmm. and they start yeah. filing out of the room because really, as the audience member, you know, you if you're a liberal or probably someone living in modern times, this guy's been an asshole this yeah. entire movie, and you don't like him, and you can see what's driving his assholishness. But in this moment where you see his soul, for want of a better word, laid bare in front of a group of strangers. Um, and you see his transition and you see his recognition that he was wrong and he needs to atone and, and fix this and vote not guilty because it's the right thing to do. Then you have this enormous respect for him and you kind of empathize with his humiliation and also admire him for having the courage to overcome that and change his mind. And I think leaving that moment drawn out for you to just sit in that emotion was a very smart move because... I think it's the more the mentality we need to have when someone concedes a point in a debate or comes to us and says, you know, we have, I've changed my mind on the topic is, you know, especially if I was the one, you know, like, you were wrong. I was wrong. You were right. Kind of thing is to give that honor and space to that because it's actually a, a pretty big thing, which again, is this whole being open to changing your mind and the importance of integrity being part of the themes of the film. So uh, yeah, it's just phenomenal. Yeah. And it's it's a it's a, a wonderful example of how you can write a character uh, and and humanize him without going all the way and making him likable. Because yeah, you by by the at the end of the movie you can find him admirable because he's changed his mind, you know, and he and as you say, he's laid bare his soul. He's been humanized. It doesn't make everything he did up to that point okay. You know, it doesn't justify everything he did, but it allows you to understand it. It allows you to sympathize with him and to think, okay, he's not a bad guy. He's, you know, he, he just, he has a lot of baggage and he made some wrong choices in his life, but he's not a villain. Um, even though really his function in the story is that of the villain. Um, and then there's that, as you say, they let that moment breathe and the other jurors kind of, now that they've reached their verdict, they, they all sort of are filing out of the room and Henry Fonda's character lingers a bit and uh, the last two people to leave the room are him and juror number three and he helps juror number three on with his coat, uh, which is an, a lovely moment to show that there's exactly no... empathy. Yeah, there's no antagonism between them anymore. He's not like, ha, see, I told you he wasn't guilty. You know, he wants to sort of embrace him and say, it's okay. You know, we, we were never enemies, which was a lovely moment. 
Um, scrolling through your notes here. Oh, well, you mentioned the foreshadowing. I wanted to talk about that a little bit because uh, I, when, when I watched it uh, most recently, uh, I watched it with my wife and we, we talked as we watched it and then we talked about it after the movie. And I noticed that uh, as, as, as wonderful as that foreshadowing is, and you're, I agree with you, like the, the symmetry of the story uh, is, is, is really well executed. Um, the way it goes from one versus 11 to 11 versus one and the, the, the way those shifts are done is really wonderful. Um, but you can tell that uh, the writer, Reginald Rose, is totally on Henry Fonda's side. Oh yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, and Reginald Rose was a great. He 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 really is one of my favorite writers, and he was a very a very progressive minded, a very uh, humanistic writer. Uh, so of course, if there is a character in this movie that that sort of adopts the writer's viewpoint, it would be the Henry Fonda character. Uh, but the deck is stacked a little bit in his favor because some of those moments where the characters fall on their own swords are so neat you know like the what the, the, my favorite of course is the one where juror number three gets really really angry at him uh and he says i'll kill you yes and they've had, <laughs> and they've had a, a an argument about that before because you know a witness in the case heard the boy fighting with his father who he is said to have killed and he said i'm gonna kill you and henry fonda said well you know people say they're gonna kill you but they don't really mean it. They're just angry. They don't really mean they're literally going to murder you. And juror number three said, oh, anybody, don't tell me, anybody who says that kind of a thing to a person means it. And then later on, he actually says it to Henry Fonda, and Henry Fonda gets the mic drop moment where he can say, <laughs> you don't really mean you'll kill me, do you? Yeah. And it's like, oh, I mean, it feels good, but it also feels like a setup. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Yeah, that's a little too, you know, there are bits of it that are too neat, you know, the finding the exact knife, the, the, Mrs., the fabulous or whatever wonderful Mrs. Bainbridge call out. There are, yeah, tricks, yeah. tricks within it, um, but it's still, yeah, enjoyable if you kind of, kind of wink at the hokiness. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, 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 it's drama, you know, it's a drama. It's not just, it, it doesn't play like a security tape from this jury deliberation. It's, it's not it's, found footage. No, it's theater. <laughs> And it's and it's wonderful theater. I mean, it's theater that has uh, some really serious themes, some really important things to say, some really wonderful bits of character writing. But you know, yeah, there's that famous moment as well when one of the the key pieces of evidence in the case is the knife that was supposedly the murder weapon, and Henry Fonda produces an identical knife from his pocket and puts it right down into the table next to the murder weapon to prove that this, you know, these knives are more common maybe than people would have thought. And of course, it's complete bullshit. I mean, it's just, it's pure drama. Yeah. Uh, you couldn't do that in a real court. No. Jury room. Yeah. And no, you could, Henry Fonda would have been kicked off the jury immediately. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> but, but that's, that's okay. Like it doesn't, it doesn't, it's not a docudrama. It's a drama. And, and, and it plays and works very well as that. Um, you also talk uh, in your notes, and we and we talked about this when we when we spoke before, uh, the concept of uh, talking about the, the sort of the the different subgroups that people are in within the larger group of the jury, um, the idea of uh, space invaders. We saw this. We see this with the immigrant. We already talked a little bit about how the immigrant kind of catches a little bit of hell from one of the other jurors for presuming to tell him something that he clearly doesn't know. Uh, and then there's also the the Jack Klugman character, who who is really he's really the first one to sort of reveal himself to not be one of the others, because he's the one who says, you know, uh, when he, he grew up in a slum, just like. The defendant did and they all they've all been sort of talking about you know kids from slums you know how they are not necessarily not quite racist but very you know sort of talking down to the idea of you know well you know poor people they're just they're just not the same as we are and jack klugman kind of speaks up and says oh excuse me i'm one of them you know maybe you want to talk to me like that 
Yeah, the idea of Space Invaders, and I can't remember the name of the author, but she wrote a book about uh, the way that the actual dynamics of a group changes when people who aren't members of that group start to occupy it. And I think her interest in particular was women moving into parliament or parliamentary bodies. And the idea is that the, if you look at Hannah Pitkin's uh, The Concept of Representation book, I think that's the right title, she talks about the difference between descriptive and substantive representation and different forms of representation. So you can maybe have, you know, men who substantially represent women because they work for issue, women, women's issues and things that women care about, but how important is it that you actually have women in those spaces to do that kind of stuff and bring not only sort of their descriptive representation and women representing women, but also substantively women women's experiences, bringing, making that part of the legislative process. So that's a long lead up to this comment, it really is attached. But the idea of the space invaders in 12 Angry Men that I see is, as you pointed out, the immigrant who is a non-American, so he's like another form of the other. And then the Jack Klugman who is sort of you know, economically uh, an outsider because he came from a slum background and might be able to blend, you know, here like sort of when you had like very light um, skinned black people who would pass for white before we had racial equality in law at least. Um, so the, not only do they make contributions in terms of you know, just being members of the jury, but they also bring their perspective to it. And this becomes important in the discussion of the switchblade knives, because it, having the background that Klugman's character has, he's able to challenge the prosecution's case on how the stabbing happened and describe it and, and brought out his switchblade and he wouldn't have stabbed over, he would have done under. And bringing that into the jury room again is, I don't know if that would be illegal, but... <laughs> <laughs> um, but it does show that when people who aren't part of what's perceived as the in-group start to occupy that space, there's, it changes the dynamics of the group because they are now inclusive of others. And it also brings in other people's lived experiences to be taken into the consideration when decisions are made. So that was the space invaders um, and also political science theory ties that I saw in the film. <laughs> and it, the, the space invaders, to use that term, uh, in in this movie, they they make the group stronger. I think that's that's the important lesson that I take from it. If you want to look, if you want to read it in terms of you know uh, uh, what what its attitude toward diversity is, uh, this group is even though they're all white guys, there is some diversity in the group from different backgrounds. They they work different occupations. They come from different levels of life. They're different ages, and in almost every case, we see that the diversity is a source of strength, that the people who come from different backgrounds bring things to the table that the other people lack. They supply each other's deficiencies, and the diversity makes the group stronger than it would be if everybody had come from the exact same place. And you mentioned Klugman's character knowing about the switchblade, and we also talked earlier about the immigrant sort of having the outsider's perspective of the American system and being able to to articulate what makes it good and what makes it noble better than any of the other people in the room. There's also the old man who draws on his experience as an older person, as an aging person, to have some some unique insight into the testimony of, of a couple of the witnesses. Um, and we see that it, the diversity is actually a, it's a source of strength. And that's another, and it's another Thing that Reginald Rose as a writer was very fond of. Uh, he, he, he felt that way as well. At least I, I, I assume that he felt that way from watching much of his work. Uh, that's often a message that he seems to be sending, that diversity is a good thing, that when, we, when we're skeptical or dismissive or, or uh, you know, suspicious of outsiders just because they're not one of us, that that is a bad thing that we should overcome that suspicion. We should bring people in. We should, we should allow people's differences to become a part of our community because it makes us better. You know, that, that is one of the noblest of all the American ideals. That used to be something that we would think of as making the United States a, a strong nation, a good nation, a proud nation, is the fact that we bring people in from other nations. We welcome people to come here and become a part of us. I mean, it's it's the Emma Lazarus poem that's written on the Statue of Liberty. Bring me your tired, your poor, your the the tempest tossed. Send those to me. It's such a beautiful, noble ideal, and we've gotten away from that. I think many of us in the United States today, but we see that demonstrated very artfully in this movie. That it's not just 
the native born rich white guys, you know, it's, yeah, it's the older guy. It's the immigrant. It's the guy who grew up in the slum. It's the working man, the guy who's, who's a house painter. Um, they all draw on their different backgrounds and their different experiences. And they would not have been able to come to the decisions or reach the insights that they do in this movie if they were all the same. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> just yeah, yes, here, here. <laughs> I talk a lot. Um, no, I, that was fantastic. No, it was, it, it's perfect. It, it, it does sum it up. I think, I think, I think beautifully. I think the only thing that you know we haven't maybe talked about now yeah. that we talked about before was its relevance to today and some of the issues uh, that we're still facing in terms of um, equality, racial equality, bigotry, things like that. But. Yeah, well, because there's there's this well, the thing about that is that I noticed, and I think we talked about this last time, and uh, they argue about this explicitly in the movie is the the sense of having responsibility for other people. Uh, there's there's an argument early in the movie where Henry Fonda's character says, uh, you know, we have we have a responsibility to to do right by this defendant. And he's already talked about how the defendant has had a rough life and he's sort of come from an underprivileged background. And the, the racist character, who has not yet been ostracized, says, let me tell you something, mister, we don't owe that kid a thing. And I think that's, uh, again, a really, uh, a really good conflict to sort of be aware of and to talk about if we want to talk about what can we take from it today. That's also an argument that we have with each other all the time is how much responsibility do those of us who are fortunate enough to be in some privileged categories have towards yeah. the less fortunate? I think his next line is, um, he got a fair trial, didn't he? Do you have any idea how much that trial cost? Yeah. Like that's, that's what you owe him is a fair trial in prison time. That's, you know, that's the breaks. <laughs> um, yeah. And I think that there is a, a there's obviously the, the issues about race that came up and the way that people are, are perceived and the problem of racism, but outside the film, it's just, you know, the systematic racial disparities in the U.S. prison system. It's kind of depressing. That I don't know how much better things have gotten when this movie was first put out in terms of the number of, you know, whites and blacks in terms of the ratio of incarcerations and arrests to now, but I can't imagine it's that much different. No, I can't imagine. And uh, we still have a problem, we, uh, some of us, many of us, we still have a real problem and a real resentment when we feel like we're being asked to take care of other people. You know, uh, we, when we feel like, we, like the, the racist character in 12 Angry Men, like he, feel, he, he feels put upon when it's suggested that he owes something to this kid even though all he's really being said to owe him is just the simple courtesy of making a, a, a real effort to decide whether or not he really is, deserves to be convicted of this crime. Um, there's a sense that I guess for, for a lot of people today, like the social contract is just, is just a burden to them. You know, oh, I don't owe him anything. We don't owe each other anything. And to someone sitting in my chair or the way I see things, we do owe each other things. We do owe it to each other. We're a part of the same society. We're a part of the same community. We owe it to each other to, to treat each other with respect and to take care of each other. And if, and if there are people in our community that are having a hard time of it, we owe it to them to try and lift them up, you know? And we see that attitude in 12 Angry Men with some of these jurors, and we see the opposite of it. The, again, the empathy side of it sort of coming in and saying, whoa, ho, hold on a second. You know, we do owe this to people. And this, and it really, it's not even asking all that much. You know, Henry Fonda says multiple times during the film, I just think we owe this kid a few words. I just think we owe this kid. He's constantly pitching it to the other jurors like, well, let's just take an hour. Let's just talk about it. He's trying to show them that it's really not that much. He's not making an unreasonable demand by saying, look, we're, we've been given the power in this situation. Let's use it responsibly. I agree. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm not no, giving you okay. anything to say. No, no. I'm just setting you. I'm just setting you up because I yeah. kind of forget we're on a hangout. It's just like yeah. watching you on YouTube sometimes. Oh. Like, oh, this is really good. <laughs> Steve is really good today. That's this is like so, this is a good one. <laughs> that's so sweet. 
it's 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 always sweet when when you get those kind of compliments from someone who's clearly a lot smarter than you are. <laughs> Well, I think, you know, the, 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 you know, I like, this is why I want to, you know, help promote your channel, because I, yeah. I think you have a lot of good things to say, and I've done a lot of talking, and, and I wrote all the notes, so, you know, I've made contributions, I don't feel slighted in any way. Oh, I'm glad. Uh, I'm just having a good time chatting with you, that's yeah. all, I mean, I know this is work, but this is a bit more like a hangout, really, more than anything. Yeah, Absolutely. Just talking about a movie that we both like. Yeah, exactly. Um, well, one more thing about that movie. I think we've covered all of the big stuff, uh, not always in the order that you wrote it, but that's okay. Um, but I, I, you brought up the storm, and the storm is a really big symbol in this movie. Um, I remember a long time ago, I took a film class where we watched, the movie we watched uh, when we did this exercise was Cool Hand Luke, but we could easily have done it with, with 12 Angry Men, where we watched the movie, and then in the discussion afterwards, we all went around, and everybody had to pick out a symbol that they saw in the movie. And one of the big symbols in 12 Angry Men that you could pick out if you were engaged in such a discussion is the storm. The storm is a huge symbol in this movie and it symbolizes all sorts of things it symbolizes the the deadlock and the jury when they get tied six six but it also symbolizes sort of the 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 breaking of that deadlock and the the moving toward resolution yeah i think you know it um they've talked in the first part of the film often about how hot it is and you can see that they're irritated when one guy's got a cold and um this is when there's the most tension in the room the most you know adversity in terms of uh, opposition to the idea the kid could be not guilty and then eventually yeah, you work your way you work your way to the six six deadlock and then the, the clouds roll in and it darkens and they have a break too from the action so it's a little bit also of an emotional break from an intense emotional scene that's just happened in the film uh, but yeah you can kind of now feel like cooler heads are prevailing <laughs> almost, yeah. you know in the room and uh, yeah so that that element of the heat and the irritation um, goes away after that point and it shifts more into the you know the final emotional arc but it it, it did when I, I why is like the storm coming at this point in the movie I remember asking myself this question and then I was looking because I was making notes um, at that time, I think, because I, I just had the idea to watch, have this discussion with you. So I was making notes because I was watching it. I went, oh, it's 6-6. Six, six. Right, okay. So it's like a shift, like a barometric shift from whatever low pressure over to high pressure or something. Uh, yeah, so I thought it worked um, quite well in the film. And I, again, it, it seems like this comes up over and over in this movie, something that is is typically seen as a negative thing turns out to be a positive thing because they talk about the storm like you know oh there's a storm coming like, nobody looks forward to a storm but the storm gets there and then after the storm passes you know that's when they realize they, they figure out how to how to work the fan you know <laughs> and it cools everything off uh that's when they, they you know they, they sort of break their six six uh, deadlock. The the uh, that's when the um, the broker breaks, isn't it? With all the yeah. rain in the background, and he's on. Yeah. Well, he doesn't break all the way, but he does at least admit that he was wrong for the first time. I think. Yeah, yeah, and he uh, and then the the baseball fan sort of loses his motivation for voting guilty because uh, he, they assume that the baseball game is going to be rained out. Right. So he doesn't really have anywhere to go anymore. So there's no excuse for him to want to just get out as quickly as possible. So he changes his vote. And never, again, he never quite comes all the way around, but uh, he he be, seems to become a little bit more open to the discussion. Um, and, and of course, closing. Oh, no, oh no, you finished up. Well, I was going to say, there, there's, there's also that really, it, having the fan work also gives us that great little comic relief moment when the uh, the the baseball fan is tossing balled up pieces of paper at the fan and having the blades like whack him around the room and one of them <laughs> hits the old man in the head <laughs> and he immediately looks up and goes, that's a damn stupid thing to do. <laughs> yeah, I think it's some of the only comic relief that was in there. And it was, you know, you had just had some emotional intense scenes and it was good. But I was going to say um, that, you know, after the catharsis that the shouty man has at the end, you know, so the storm comes through and they finish up the film, it, it reaches its climax and then they leave, right? Because they, they never hear the, the announcement of the jury, what they 
Mm -hmm. cut to is the exterior shot of the courthouse and the steps are still wet from the rain and it's like you know hopefully some bit of hatred has been washed away and cleaned from the city through this process um, and then of course the, the final two characters um, have their last bit of dialogues where we learn their names yeah so but I can't remember what they are so I'm going to need you to step in oh I, I, know what, I remember what they are <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. it's just yeah, this man, that man. That's it. Yeah, it was. Uh, well, it, yeah. The uh, it's uh, juror number eight, Henry Fonda, and the old man who was his his first ally. They sort of find each other outside on the steps of the courthouse, and uh, the old man says, uh, "Hey, what's your name?" And he says, uh, "Henry Fonda says my name is Davis," and the old man says, "My name is McArdle." And then he kind of pauses for an awkward second and goes, "Well, so long." You know, and then you get that sort of poignant realization that these guys are never going to see each other again. You know, we've seen them together for an hour and a half, and they've formed all of these weird relationships with each other. They've had alliances and they've broken alliances. It's like they've had this real, what you would think would be a, like a life changing experience. And now they're never going to see each other again. They just yeah. go their separate ways. Yeah. And that's because, as he said in The Immigrant, you know, we are strangers. We come together. We have no stake in this. We're just asked to determine if this person is guilty or um, innocent. And that's what happens. So, yeah. yeah. A really good movie. Yeah. So, uh, watch it again. Watch it again. When you get to the end of this show, watch it again. Oh, yeah. If you've, if you've seen it a dozen times, you can always watch it again. And uh, it's it's on DVD. It's available, I think, to rent on Amazon Instant Video. So it's it's not terribly hard to find. Um, and yeah, it's just it's such a good movie. I mean, we've been talking about it in terms of the things you can read into it and the sort of lessons you can take from it and uh, different themes that it has. And it, it it I think it bears that weight very well. But I mean, if you just look at it just as a movie. It's such a great movie. I mean, it's got such wonderful drama. The performances are amazing. Let me let me just read the cast list because I haven't read the cast list yet, and we're we're gonna get we're almost done. But the uh, the cast of this movie, if you're thinking 1957 like Hollywood movie TV cast, you could not possibly think of a better twelve a, a group of twelve more impressive actors than this. Uh, Martin Balsam, John Fiedler, Lee J. Cobb, who is juror number three, the shouty man, my favorite character. E.G. Marshall, Jack Klugman, Edward Binns, Jack Warden, Henry Fonda, of course, Joseph Sweeney, Ed Begley, George Voskovic, and Robert Weber. These are guys who, if you watch a lot of old TV like Twilight Zones or Alfred Hitchcock or, uh, or uh, Studio One or uh, Playhouse 90, which are two of my favorite shows ever, um, you'll see these guys pop up in a lot of stuff. They were very you know, well-popular, you know, well, uh, hard-working actors that, that appeared in a lot of different stuff and they're all just fantastic. Um, and again, directed by Sidney Lumet, who would go on to become a legendary director written by Reginald Rose, one of my, really one of my favorite writers ever. Uh, just a great, great movie. And if you, if for some reason have watched this entire video and you haven't seen the movie, <laughs> I hope that you weren't completely lost, <laughs> but go see the movie. Yes, and if you have watched this whole thing without uh, knowing, having seen it before, then you're going to be able to see all the stuff we've talked about, all the foreshadowing and the thematic stuff as you watch it. So you can look forward to that. Yeah, if you're anything like, and like, like you said at the beginning, Christy, like you show this movie to your friends. Like this is a movie that uh, people discover in that way. Like I discovered it, I actually, I actually found it through a class. I took a, a, a class when I was right out of uh, high school, when I first flirted with going to college before I actually went all the way, uh, I, I took a psychology class where we watched, we actually watched the new version, the 97 version. Uh, and I thought that's, that's interesting. I want to go back and see the original. And I saw the original or I, you know, this version, technically not the original, but this, this version we've been talking about the 1957 Henry Fonda version and just fell in love with it. And just, I wanted to show it to everybody else I knew. You know, it was just that kind of a movie. Um, and it's it's a movie that, I mean, still to this day, a lot of people obviously have a lot of regard for. I just saw a couple weeks ago on an episode of Inside Amy Schumer, the entire episode was a 12 Angry Men spoof. All right. <laughs> yeah, and it was hilarious. And it was it was shot in black and white. It was like, you know, really mimicking the visual style of, of this movie. And it was it was just hilarious. So clearly, if people are still doing those kind of loving 
very detailed tributes to this movie. It's it's made uh, an impact on a lot of people. So uh, hopefully, if you haven't seen it, we've given you a reason to see it. <laughs> and if you have seen it, we've given you a reason to to look at it again. Definitely, yeah. definitely, yeah. Yeah. Well, I guess that's it, Christy. This has been as much fun as it was the first time. Yeah, it's <laughs> it's. It, if I were more religious, I might say it was a blessing in disguise yes. that we got to uh, to do this again. We did this before, and it was all kind of garbled. Google kind of screwed up my video, but uh, we we but got we, to do it again. We both felt it was so important and so enjoyable that we had to take time out to have the exact same conversation. Well, not the exact same conversation, but have basically the same conversation again. But I also want to say that when, um, as soon as we finished recording, before I learned from you that it hadn't worked out, I went downstairs because I was staying with friends in the UK at the time and said, have you ever had a conversation that was so nice that you wanted to have it again just to kind of have it again? And like, that's a conversation I just had. And then I found out from you about the next day that we were going to have to have it again. It's like, yay! That's great. <laughs> Your wish came true. <laughs> well, um, th thank you for joining me again to have this conversation. And who knows, maybe we'll have it a third time. Oh. I don't know. Maybe maybe <laughs> next time we can just have it just the two of us. We won't have to record anything. We can just hang out. <laughs> that sounds good. And, third time is definitely, I think there's, a, there's some kind of forces working against us or something. <laughs> yes, exactly. Oh, <laughs> uh, wow. So anyway. That's it, everybody. Thanks for watching. Uh, thanks for bearing with us. Hope you found this uh, of interest. Christy, it was tons of fun. Uh, we'll have to do this again sometime about something else. I agree. This was a lot of fun. Uh, next time, we'll just do it the ones. Uh, but yeah, if I can do a little bit of a <laughs> shout out. Um, I'm trying to reach 1,000 subscribers by my one-year anniversary, which is in September. I'm at 800 at the moment. Ooh. So if people like me here, maybe they could visit me on my channel, too. Yes, absolutely. There will be a link to Christy's channel in the description of this video. And uh, if you found her to be as, as insightful as, as I find her, uh, you'll love her YouTube channel. It's, it's, it's really, really awesome. I, I gave you a shout out a while ago in my You Had to Ask series, but uh, every little bit helps. If you, if, you, if you really enjoyed this video, please go check out Christy's YouTube channel because it is excellent. It's well worth your time. Thank you, Steve. Uh, oh, Peshaw. <laughs> it's the least I can do. You deserve it. Thank you. Um, Anyway, that's it. Thanks for watching, everybody. <laughs>